Welcome to What's Cooking in Sports with former NFL defensive end Gary Burley. Now get ready to find out what's up, what's in, and what's going down in sports with some of the biggest names on the field, on the court, and in the business. Gary, it's all yours. Welcome to What's Cooking in Sports. We have a show for you today. We have legendary coach Pat Dye, Lindy Davis of Lindy's Magazine, and Isis Jones are going to give us a update on what's going on in entertainment in Birmingham. So sit back, relax, and we're going to get right to it. Ah. Power of Ah. Ah. Brought to you in part by Alabama Power. Always on. You haven't seen it until you've seen it in Charter HD. Call now to add Charter HD for only $5 more a month and watch all your favorite programs in HD. Charter, let it all in. I'm Chris Butler, CEO, founder of Butler's Grooming for Men. We started Butler's in 2009 um, with the basic concept of providing men with a uh, destination. It's so much more than a haircut. It was really word of mouth and reputation that brought me in. When you get out of that chair, everything is going to be done through perfection. Welcome back to What's Cooking in Sports. Uh, this weekend, Auburn had a mighty, mighty victory over Alabama A&M. And I had the honor and the pleasure of meeting one of the greatest coaches, not only in Auburn history, but also in the history of college football, Coach Pat Dye. Coach? Yeah, it's great to be with you. <laughs> well, we got so much to talk about, and we've got one of your, fav one of your favorite fans here. Yeah, he's one of my pets. Is that right? <laughs> Well, well, we're going to ask you some, some secret questions about him, too. Now. <laughs> well, Coach, you know, um, it was exciting to see Auburn uh, uh, play the game that they played uh, and give an opportunity to Alabama and A&M. But as we all know, this week is the big game, the Iron Bowl. Yep, yep. And uh, this is a, it's a situation where since I've been in Birmingham and Alabama, actually, for the last six years, I find that there's a fever pitch that is like no other rivalry. Why is it like that, Coach? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's one that people in the state of Alabama, the mentality is, you know, it's 365 days a year. And, uh, you know, even the Alabama A&M fans and the, and the uh, Troy State and Jacksonville State and Alabama State, all of them, you know, they, they pick sides the, the day Auburn and Alabama play, and that's just the way it is in this state. And uh, it's been like that since I first became a part of it back in 1965 on the other side of the state. And, uh, and then for the last 30 years here in Auburn, you know, it's just a, it's just a big rivalry game and one that, that uh, the winners – you know, live in peace for a year, and the losers have to suffer the consequences. <laughs> I have never seen anything like this where families go against one another because one family is Alabama, one family is Auburn, and they start to argue and this and that. I said, people, it's just a football game, but I've learned that it's not just a football game, Coach. No, it's a way of life, and, and uh, it's been that way a long time, and, and I don't see it ever changing. It's, uh, you know, it's a... It's a great rivalry, and you know one of the things that that uh, I've said, and, and I've watched this ball game, like I said, since '65. The fans, you know, they'll get in with each other, and there might be some bad blood, but 
it's a it's a hard fault. It's one of the hardest fault and cleanest football games that you'll ever see and ever play in. And uh, and the, and it's out of and the, out of respect the players have for each other. And uh, it's always been that way. And you know we won some close games and we lost some close games, but it's always been it's always been a great great football game. Coach Dodd, this is Lionel James. You are two of the greatest men that have ever appeared in my life, and those two men are you and my father. And I remember in the winter of 1981, once you came to Auburn and you got there, one of the first things you spoke to us as a team was, you guys are looking for discipline, looking for discipline. And I kind of felt that, you know, I said, man, what is he talking about? But then, once we hit the football field, it was 100% wide open all day, all night long until we got it right. And sometimes we even started practices over. Well, oh yeah. one of the statements that one of the reporters asked you was, how long would it take to beat Alabama? And you said 60 minutes. Did you have that much confidence that you could do that so early? Well, what I, what I, that that statement really, Lionel, was a compliment to Alabama, because you wasn't you wasn't going to beat Alabama in less than sixty minutes. They ain't going to make you play the full <laughs> sixty minutes. And and how many of those games have come down to the last second? And every, uh, every one I played in. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. It wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't being a, it wasn't a smart like, remark or anything. It's just. Uh, you know, play the full 60 minutes and, you know, and you learn how to do that. You learn how to do that at, at Auburn and, uh, you know, and really and truly we learned that, in my opinion, we learned that in a game that we lost to Georgia where you had an 87-yard touchdown run to put us ahead in the fourth quarter. Yes, sir. And, uh, and they came back and scored and we took it back to the inside the 15-yard line somewhere in there and time ran out on us. And that, But if you remember going back in the dressing room after the game was over, all the people were still there cheering for, for the effort, y'all. Because I, uh, I, as well as I can remember, I think Georgia came in there ranked number one in the nation and, and y'all had played them right toe-to-toe -to -toe all day long and, and had a chance to win right down to the last second. And if you remember in the dressing room, I told you that, that, that the, everybody was proud of you and you give everything you had to win and that's all that we could ask. But we was going to have the same opportunity in two weeks and we was going to win, which we did. Right. And, uh, and that was one of the all-time great pictures at, at, uh, at Auburn, the, six, the 82 game. And, uh, and we had to come from behind in the fourth quarter to, to win it. Right, but I, I, if we back up one and go back to the 81 season, we play, and that was after your first spring practice. And that spring practice, I think we started out with like 120, 130 players and ended up that spring <laughs> practice with about 60. Okay, but those 60, we, those 60 guys that made it through, you said if you can make it through this, you can make it through anything in life. Well, that year we lost to Alabama, and I remember – it is a story I tell my kids all the time, especially my son. We were sitting in there, and, and you were saying the Lord's Prayer after the game, and you said they outmanned us this year. We didn't have the manpower for this year. But then, lo and behold, we didn't know you was going out to sign Bo Jackson <laughs> that next year. <laughs> well, you know, Bo certainly has his history in that ball game, as you know. And, uh, you know, and... and and of course, eighty-two. But Lyle, you know what? You made the block on the on the corner on that two hundred and sixty-pound defensive end in order to keep him from penetrating and keeping both from going over the top. And you didn't weigh but one hundred seventy-five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> you weighed that much. Co Coach, trust me, now, he he has told me the this story. Of, that was the kind of heart that that football team had, and. And uh, nobody was a bigger part of it, and nobody was a bigger leader on that football team than you were. I appreciate now. that, Coach. Coach, um, I've had some great coaches uh, in my life. Johnny Majors, Jackie Sherrill, 
Forrest Gregg, and, and, and the common thread that runs through all those guys are what I've seen with you. And it's like you have a process. And kind of explain to me why or how you develop that process, because it seems like you teach the, the athlete and the man at the same time, and I don't think a lot of coaches do that. Well, you know, that's just the way the relationship, I, I think it started with me with my high school coach, and, and, uh, and, and I love that. I love my high school coach, and I love that relationship and that feeling that we have between each other. And that's when I made up my mind that I was going to coach football. I said, if I can have the, that kind of feeling and that kind of relationship with players, that that would be a great way to live your life. And that's, you know, that's what I did. And, uh, but, you know, I, Jackie Sherrill was on the, the first, played for me the first year I was on the coaching staff at Alabama, which was the first coaching job I ever had. And then, of course, Johnny Majors, you mentioned, Johnny was playing tailback at Tennessee when I was a prospect in high school and visited Knoxville, Tennessee as a, as a high school prospect to go to Tennessee. And Johnny was a tailback on a great, great Tennessee football team. And uh, so, you know, if you stay in the game long enough, you're going to cross paths with a lot of, a lot of outstanding men and, and, uh, and players. And uh, they'll have a... They'll, they'll all have a special place in your heart, and and, uh, and it's a it's a it's a it's a great way to live your life. Well, to add to that though, coach, there was one thing you always made us do, and then a lot of the colleges now have gotten away from it. You always had us to wear a coat and tie during the Tiger Walk, always. And I know there was a reason. I like for you to share that with with the rest of your fans. Well, you know, that's just kind of the way I was raised, Lionel. It was a, it, it was a, it was a big day, and and you were gonna be in front of a lot of people, and and the and the public, and on national television, and all of the things that go along with college football at, at that level. And I wanted, I wanted them to see you dressed and and, and just and. And of course, it was a little bit of a business day for us um, when we went to play a football game. You know, we had fun playing, and, and but uh, and y'all had done the work through, through the week. If you like the rest of my players, you'll tell folks right quick that Saturday was easy. Saturday was Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday that was hard. Yes, sir. A lot of start over in practice. Okay, you ready? Surprise! Yeah! Wait for me! Come on! Yeah! Yeah, 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 yeah. Daddy? Yeah? Uh, yeah! The power of yeah. Yeah. Brought to you in part by Alabama Power. Always on. You haven't seen it until you've seen it in Charter HD. Call now to add Charter HD for only $5 more a month and watch all your favorite programs in HD. Charter. Let it all in. Well, Coach, we know that uh, the season's ending up and uh, there's been a, a, a fresh breath of life breathed into Alabama with the the losses of the two teams that were ahead of them. Um, what do they have to do from here on out, Coach, in your opinion, uh, to – I know they don't have anything to do with uh, the actual selection, but what do you think Alabama has to focus on to get to the next level? Well, you know, the, uh, the uh, first thing they got to do is beat Auburn Saturday. Right. <laughs> you know, they favor 
reading the paper this morning, they favored by 34, so she, they should win that football game, and then they got to beat Georgia. Now, Georgia is, is to me, has not been as disciplined a football team as Alabama has been all year long, but they have great, they have great talent on that football team, and they, you know, they can play with anybody in the country, including Alabama. So that'll be a great, that'll be a great college football game, and and uh, Georgia Tech is 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 probably going to challenge Georgia a little bit Saturday because they scored 150 some points in the last two ball games, and uh, Georgia can't be looking ahead to Alabama. Don't they'll they'll slip up against Georgia Tech. But well, now you know if if something should happen. And and see, uh, Oregon's still kind of in there, and Notre Dame, and I don't think Notre Dame will lose to Southern Cal. But if they did, and and uh, Georgia lost to Georgia Tech, and then Alabama lost to Georgia, then you'd have you'd probably have Oregon playing Florida in the national championship game. Oh wow, we don't want that. <laughs> Well, I, I know it, but I mean, there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that can happen between now and the, you know, at, at the end of the season. Well, that bring, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me ask you this. The other thing is, other thing is listen, Playoff. if Oregon loses again, if they lost to Oregon State, or they're going to have to play UCLA, if, 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 uh, now, they got a mess out there on the West Coast because, so UCLA has already won that division of that conference. They got to play Stanford. If Stanford beats UCLA, then they're going to win the North, and they're going to have to turn right around and play UCLA again in the in the, in the conference championship game. And uh, so, I mean, it's a it's a wacky thing that's going on in college football right now. The way they got the BCS voting and all. It's, it's crazy the way it is. But, of course, Alabama, they kind of control their own destiny. They rank number two now, and all they've got to do is win. Well, Coach, since That's you all said – That's Notre, Notre Dame's got to do is win. If they win, but now Notre Dame has got a much easier road than Alabama because Alabama's got to play Georgia, and Georgia is a capable football team. Well, Coach, since you – They've got offense and defense and playmakers on both sides of the ball. And – uh and playing in Atlanta, it ain't gonna be any home field advantage for Alabama. Now Alabama will have their fans there, but Georgia probably have them outnumbered in fans in, in Atlanta. Well, coach, to, to kind of piggyback on what you said about Alabama, uh, and this is just a personal question for me. I don't, I'm trying to understand their defensive line scheme, and for the last several weeks, we've been talking about the defensive line. Uh, I'm not seeing the type of pass rush and containment that I think you have to play to win a national championship, let alone, you know, win the games of teams that have quarterbacks that can actually throw the ball and execute. Get outside the park. Is, is, that, uh, is that their scheme for the defensive line to play the way they do? Or? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Coach Sabres and his, his – his deal on defense is he's going to stop the run, and and it's easier to stop the run if you if you play in, you know if you play in a, a different kind of technique on the line of scrimmage, and and freeing up your linebackers and keeping them clean and so forth. But they also Alabama can get to the quarterback, but most of the time, and you know unless they're playing somebody they can just dominate. You know basically they. have They've been relying on the blitz to get pressure on the quarterback, which makes them play man-to-man -man in the secondary, and it does make them a little vulnerable if they don't get that. But uh, Alabama's going to play you with eight people against the run all the time, and sometimes that ninth one is coming pretty quick. And, uh, and they're going to play man on the corners even in running down. So uh, if nobody can, nobody can fault uh, Alabama's defensive scheme and what they do because it's been proven over the years and, and not that many college quarterbacks that can can pick a defense apart and uh, it's uh, 
you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'd do anything different if I was Alabama. But they don't have a, they don't have a dominant pass rusher like that Jarvis Jones that, that uh, Georgia's got a clown here in South Carolina. Well, that explains a whole lot to me, Coach, because I didn't understand. I mean, uh, you've got guys getting out of their pass rush lanes, going inside, knocking off the pursuit. And I was always wondering, is that, is that part of their plan? Are they taught to, to play like that? And I'm glad you explained, you know, what their, what their defensive line scheme is. Because yeah. I was confused. Well, it's, I'll tell you what, they don't, I mean, they're just not going to let you run the football. And they're going to stop you running. They're going to force you to throw the football. And they get you behind the chains. And then they're coming out to your quarterback. And uh, he's going to have to get rid of the football in a hurry. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, now Alabama... Alabama, you know, uh, was hurt by Mettenberger at, at LSU. You know, he had a career day throwing the football against Alabama. And and the little quarterback of A&M, you know, his quickness and speed, and, and uh, you know, he's going to give anybody problems, regardless of, you know, and, uh, and he gave them some problems. But... I, I think you go back and look in, in Coach Saban's history that they've never lost to a football team that didn't get great play out their quarterback. Okay, Coach, with Tennessee looking for a new coach right now, and let's say you were the AD at Tennessee, what would you look for in hiring a head coach? Well, you asked me something I hadn't even thought about. <laughs> <laughs> and and I really don't know. I you know I really don't know enough about the 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 what Tennessee's got to do from a standpoint. It all starts with recruiting, of course. And uh, and Tennessee does not have as many high school football players coming out to the state of Tennessee as they do, you know, in Alabama and Georgia and Louisiana and Florida and other places. So. Tennessee's got to leave the state of Alabama, I mean, to be the state of Tennessee to do a lot of their recruiting. And whoever they hire has got to be, you know, he's got to, he's got to be a good recruiter before he can, you know, if you don't have players, you can't win. And uh, right now, it appears that, you know, I, I know that Tennessee's got some great players, but they don't seem to have the, the depth and all of the, the level of talent that some of the top teams in this conference have. So, you know, that being said, I, you know, I, I would have to look at all the coaches that might be available across the country. And I know that, I know that uh, Tennessee's with the tradition, everything they got up there, they can probably go higher. You know, most any coach they want to go higher. But, uh, you know, it's a, and there's a lot of good football coaches out there. It's not, it's, it's a, uh, and there's a, there's a and and they're not all in in Division One football. There's a lot of them in all schools that that uh, are coaches. I mean, you know, you know, I started at East Carolina. Coach Taylor and I think started at Bowling Green or somewhere. You don't have to you don't have to come from necessarily come from Alabama or LSU or wherever to to be a you know to to be a good football coach. It's good coaching. So they're doing a great job coaching at, at uh, Louisiana Tech, yeah. and uh, so it's uh, they'll they'll get a good football coach in, in Tennessee. Well, coach, we're coming up on a break, but before we get off, I want to thank you, but I also want to ask you your prediction for the Iron Bowl. Well, you know, I, you know, I I wish it that I wish it we had played better and. We were a little older and a little more mature, but uh, you know Alabama should win the football game. I mean, with the season that they've had and the talent level that they've got, and with experienced football players and a senior quarterback that's you know that's playing great, or whether uh, uh, well I guess he's not a senior, but he's a fourth year junior. So you know they've got a they should they should have an advantage plus playing in Tuscaloosa. Well, Coach, I really thank you for coming on this week, and, and if we may call you back next week after the game, we'd love to talk to you again. All right, sounds good. Okay. Take care. Okay.
Okay, you ready? Surprise! Yeah! Wait for me! Come on! Yeah! Yeah, 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 yeah. Daddy? Yeah? Uh, yeah! The power of yeah. Yeah. Brought to you in part by Alabama Power. Always on. You haven't seen it until you've seen it in Charter HD. Call now to add Charter HD for only $5 more a month and watch all your favorite programs in HD. Charter. Let it all in. Welcome to uh, What's Cooking in Sports, and today we have the Entrepreneur of the Year, magazine editor, publisher, all-round guy, Lindy Davis. Lindy, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great, Gary. Thanks for having me on. No, thanks for being here, man, because we needed to have the type of information that you so readily had handy. So uh, let's jump right into it. Alabama's got a great opportunity in front of them. What do you think about that? They got a mulligan, yeah, you know, for the golfers. They, they got a mulligan, and actually it's, it's almost deja vu. It happened almost identically the same way last year. Last year, after Alabama lost to LSU, Oregon and uh, had to lose, you know, last year. And, and they lost. Oklahoma State had to lose. They lost. And then this year, Alabama had three chances. Two of the three above them had to lose, and two lost the same weekend. So... Very much similar to last year, except, of course, this year, Alabama would will, will, will have to win the SEC championship game against Georgia, uh, which looks like, a, assuming Alabama and Georgia take care of their business this weekend, it's a, it's a national championship semifinal game. Well, like my college coach, Johnny Major, used to always say, you stick to your knitting. And that means that you just do what you do and let the chips fall where they may. And I think that's what happened to Alabama. The guys didn't lose faith in, in, in what the process brings to them, and you just play, and sooner or later, the other teams are going to eliminate themselves. I don't know why it always happens, but it's just been like this for 100 years. Well, I think a lot of it is, Gary, the pressure. Once you go from chasing it to being in the hot seat, you're, you're one of the top two teams. I think there's a huge pressure shift there. I really do, and I think you can see it in the way the teams play a lot especially for the teams that haven't been there a lot. Now, Oregon has been close, so, you know, I, I really maybe didn't expect it out of them as much. They played a very good Stanford team, though. Stanford has a great defensive line. They led the nation like a rushing defense, so that was a good matchup for Stanford. Uh, but uh, I was not surprised at Kansas State. They'd never been there before. Hey, besides that, they had the Sports Illustrated jinx this week. They were on the cover, so that was, a, that was almost a, I almost expected that one to happen. Well, Lindy, you brought up something that, that's been a thorn in my side for a long time, and uh, I've been watching Alabama uh, play over the years, and this year I, I'm, I'm a little suspect with the defensive line, and maybe you can help me out on this a little bit. I'm, not, well, I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm trying to figure out what their defensive line scheme is because it's not going to the passer. It's well, not well, rushing Gary, the passer. They need, they need to get you rushing the passer for them, what they need. And that's, hey, that's really, well, that's it's really funny that you mentioned that. I got, one, I got one pass rush left in me with Lindsey. <laughs> yeah, they, they've been a little short there. Uh, they thought Adrian Hubbard, he's had a solid year. They, they thought preseason that he was maybe going to be that guy that could, uh, you know, really need a double team each play type guy. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't think he's quite – I mean, he, he, he had 12 tackles and like two for a loss against LSU, so it's not like he was lineman of the week. So it's not like he's had a bad year by any means. But they have not had that consistent guy that you have to double team. And, and, and for that reason, I think they've had to bring some blitzes. And against LSU and A&M, as you saw, they, they were close, but they weren't quite there. Of course, they ran into two quarterbacks who played almost perfect games. And, you know, if you get that, you're going to have a difficult time. Or Manziel's done it to everybody all year. But, uh, yeah, they've been just 
a little bit short of having that great pass rusher, and, and, and that's probably the one thing the defense is like. With the defense saving plays, as you know, he puts the corners out there on the island. I don't care how good they are. You know, you can't cover a good receiver or a great, you know, against the top quarterback only for so long. You've got to put some pressure on the quarterback, and that's that's the one thing this deep team really is, is like. And I agree with you 100%. Well, I agree with you 100%. And Lionel and I were talking about that this morning about, um, you know, it's not all the time about a quarterback sack. It's about containing the quarterback and staying in your pass rush lanes and not knocking the pursuit off. Well, I thought that they had a real dilemma uh, against Texas A&M. When they played Michigan and Ari Robinson, they made the decision he was not going to beat them with his legs. They didn't think he could beat them with a pass. And they really just played containment. They almost didn't try to sack him. It, believe it or not, I mean, of course, they'd take a sack. But they were, you could watch, I was at the game. They were just controlling those lanes. They were not going to let him run the football. Against Manziel, they had a different situation in that he can beat you throwing the football. He throws it that well. And that's why he's, you know, had a incredible year. He can beat you with his arm or his legs. He's a very consistent passer. He's a, he's a great runner. So they were kind of in a dilemma. Uh, they couldn't sit back and just control the lanes or he'll pick you apart. But then, of course, they let him get loose a couple of times. So, and that's why he's, uh, you know, that's why he's going to New York as a potential Heisman guy as a freshman because he's created this incredible dilemma for all the defensive coordinators. And I thought Alabama would be able to do a little better job, but he was fantastic. And as you said, when you don't have a, that big time pass rusher, uh, well, you, you're going to have some problems. But it'll be interesting, Alabama, assuming they get by Auburn, uh, Georgia. Uh, has a terrific guy, a guy that can really throw the ball, but he cannot run it. He's not a, you know, Aaron Murray is not a very good runner. So that would play to Alabama's advantage, keeping it in the pocket. Uh, and their offensive line is not quite as good as a them. But that's that's a week away. Still got the Iron Bowl to deal with here. Lindy, Lionel James here. It is my pleasure to have the honor to talk to you. I have a two-part question. My first part is you said Alabama has a mulligan coming up this weekend in the Iron Bowl. So being an Auburn grad, I like to say,